Now, the big country's hidden history continues on KRBC. Thank you for staying with us. Now we want to tell you the story of James Simmons. Simmons is the benefactor of Abilene's Hardin Simmons University, and the roots of this university are deep. And deeply rooted with education around the time of the abolishment of slavery. Dutchess County, New York, 1827. Homes dot the rolling hills in quaint farmlands. It was here, in this forward-thinking corner of the world, where one of the most influential founders of Christian colleges was born to William and Clarissa Simmons. They raised a spirited, rebellious, red-headed boy who was the youngest of their five children. His name was James Barlow Simmons. Poor and unruly, but resilient and desperate for an education, James set off at age 16, joining an older brother, Edward, who taught at a school in Sheffield, Massachusetts. So Edward educated James and also brought him to the faith. Uh, there were times where James um, didn't want to read the Bible, didn't want to talk about religion. I was very skeptical of religion. Uh, his father, William, actually tried to bribe James to read the Bible, uh, pay, offering to pay him some money, and James rejected the offer. Um, he avoided going to church sometimes because he just did not want to have anything to do with organized religion. At a pivotal time, Edward poured into James, preparing him for college and leading him to Christ. Although he struggled with school, it was his gritty work ethic and humble origins which served him well. He studied under the tutelage of Dr. Francis Wayland at Brown University where friends and faculty prepared and propelled him to overcome future trials, the likes of which began abruptly as racial conflict pushed the nation to the brink of civil war. The town he grew up in, the county, uh, was the first county in New York State to support abolishing slavery. The church that he grew up in, the Baptist church, was uh, an abolitionist church. And so the place he would become educated, uh, Brown University and later Newton Theological Institute, those were places where abolitionism um, was uh, taught, or at least that's the way they, they understood the gospel. From the beginning, the United States of America were hardly united at all. And slavery was that institution that divided North and South. One of the last attempts at compromise before the Civil War was called the Compromise of 1850. And as part of that, there was an act called the Fugitive Slave Act. Slave owners wanted their slaves returned if they ran away. And so the Fugitive Slave Act made it a crime to help a runaway slave. If you were a free citizen in the North, uh, you could be punished up to $1,000 uh, for helping a runaway slave. In the 1850s, that would have been a, the average worker's annual pay. And so you have someone who's fully formed um, as a student. But now the question is, what do you do with all your knowledge? Do you just pass the test and keep it and, and get a job and make a living and, and support your family and then see the later years of your life? Or do you take your education? and use it to empower others, use it to change the world, use it to right um, a country that was, was heading in many ways in the wrong direction. Indianapolis, Indiana, 1857. Now the husband of Mary, the father of Robert, and the pastor of the First Baptist Church. Within weeks of his arrival, James attended the fugitive slave trial of a young man named West. West had attempted to escape. The sheriff followed swiftly after him as James watched the event unfold from a distance. He recounted the scene in a letter, writing, The Presbyterian marshal pursued his Methodist brother with revolver in hand, shooting at him twice before he caught him. My soul was horrified. I said to myself, When in the name of heaven shall a man who fears God speak, if not now? I did speak. My subject was the American slave system tried by the Golden Rule. That sermon would be the first of many to oppose the institution of slavery from the pulpit. To speak out against slavery was very dangerous. 
the height of the violence before the Civil War was actually in the 1830s when James Simmons was a young man. He would have been very familiar with the violent acts committed against people who spoke out against slavery. Uh, if you owned a printing press and you published anything against slavery, it would not be uncommon for a mob to gather, destroy your printing press, and then come after you. So James Simmons knew he was taking a risk when he spoke out against slavery. And for this reason, Simmons was persecuted by others, threatened even with a coat of tar and feathers, some suggested hanging. He was berated by anonymous newspaper posts and blamed by the governor of Indiana for being a troublemaker. These injustices and more came to a head one Sunday morning in January of 1861, when James arrived at his church to find it burned to the ground. But he was not deterred, preaching there for another year and including one of his most prominent sermons, The Cause and Cure of the Rebellion. You would think because of where he is and what he's speaking on, it's a tolerant area, we're in the north, but it's, it's really not. Indiana's constitution prevented black men and women from entering the state, and even if there were people there who inhabited the state before Indiana was made a state, they were asked to leave. Um, in 1861, he publishes The Cause and Cure of the Rebellion. So the Civil War starts in spring of 1861, he publishes this in September, and in it he is calling to the people of the North and blaming them just as much as the South for what is going on with the Civil War. And in this um, sermon and brochure, he declares himself an abolitionist. And that's the very first time that Simmons will publicly do that because the term abolitionist was a dirty word. And I think that's significant to his time that at the very beginning of the Civil War, he aligns himself with the cause of um, freeing people. So it's, it's a tension that's going back and forth from the policies that are being uh, designated for people of color, Negroes, slaves are at that time, and Simmons says, no, we're gonna move fully towards what it means for people of color at that time, slaves, Negroes, to participate in their, their society and their community. I think there is, there is space in every human being to imagine things different, but to pursue it, that, that's a different person. Uh, I think there were probably many people um, in Simmons' day who, who felt that this treatment of slaves or Negroes was wrong. But what did they do? And we, when we come back here on KRBC's Hidden History. But Simmons did to make a difference. We're back in two minutes. <laughs> 